So uh, welcome back. This is the fifth lecture. Uh, and, and today we're going to cover algebraic spaces and stacks. Uh, yeah, in fact, if you, the, the, I'm sort of speaking over really important moments in American history. The last three Wednesdays, we went from an insurrection to an impeachment uh, and now to an inauguration. And that sort of mirrors the three developments in this class. You know, on uh, uh, two times ago, we introduced the fundamental notion of, of pre-stacks. Uh, and then we today are going to introduce stacks. Oh, yeah, last time we introduced stacks. And then today we're going to sort of complete this picture by introducing algebraic spaces, delete Mumford stacks, and, uh, and algebraic stacks. Right. Uh, everything else we sort of we've, we've, we've covered so far. Um, yeah, so this is it, uh, yeah, an important lecture. And, uh, but let's get started. I want to begin by reviewing first the terminology of pre stacks and then stacks. And so, uh, so uh, yeah, let's recap here. So we'll fix a site S. So S is, is our site. And then a pre stack over S is just a, is, is just a functor. So it's a data of a, cat, a category X together with a functor to S. And, you know, we think of objects in here as like maybe an A and maybe there's a morphism to B and these all live over elements of the site. So if you take the projection, this might be some object like a scheme S if you're working over the site of schemes. Um, and then there were two main conditions in the definition of a pre-stack. The first was that, you know, pullbacks exist. So if you have a morphism S to T and an object B over T, there's a way, there's an object A and a morphism from A to B over that morphism. And then moreover that any map in X satisfies a universal property and of the universal property for, for similar to the universal property for fiber products. And then building off that, uh, we define a pre-stack. So if you, you turn to the, the, the right, the right hand side, uh, we, we define a pre-stack to be a stack uh, if, a, if a certain descent conditions hold. So there's two, there's, there's two conditions. The first is that uh, morphisms glue uniquely uh, in, in the topology of the site S. So maybe just to say like what that means is that if you have say an object S and you have two objects A and B over S and you have an uh, and you have a cover. And so you can consider the pullback of A to each SI. And then suppose you have maps phi I from the pullback to B such that they such that they're, they're compatible, meaning that like phi I restricted to the, the fiber product is equal because they're morphisms, you can declare them to be equal. Then the condition is that there exists a unique map A to B, um, which restricts to the given maps. So that, that's the statement that morphisms glue. And then the, the statement that objects glue is, is also with respect to an tau cover. The condition is if you have objects AI over each SI and isomorphisms between their pullbacks. Um, so here I'm really thinking of like the product of SI and the product SIJ. And then you have isomorphism, say alpha IJ is an isomorphism from, uh, let me write it this way. So you have an AI restricted to SIJ and you have an isomorphism alpha IJ to the other pullback. So these are all objects over the, the, the double fiber products. Then, and they satisfy, and then this condition, you need, to, you need them to satisfy a co-cycle condition, just like with gluing schemes or vector bundles. And then given that, then there exists an object A, uh, which pulls back to the AI, and moreover, that these isomorphisms, that, that, that isomorphisms alpha IJ are the, um, are the, are the canonical ones. All right, so that's where we were. We had pre-stacks and stacks. Uh, we also had a few examples of these. 
So uh, to any scheme, we can build, we can associate a stack. You know, in fact, to any sheaf, you can associate a stack. And the objects of the stack are just, are, are just maps. T, or let's say S. S to X. And this is, yeah, lives over the scheme S. And so, right, this is a stack over uh, the big top side. Um, and then we had, okay, that was our first example of how we view a scheme as a stack. And then we also have the stack of quasi coherent sheaves where objects were pairs of a scheme together with a quasi coherent sheaf. And, uh, and then like, uh, the main example in this entire course is MG and here the objects are smooth families of curves, of genus G curves. And then morphisms or Cartesian diagrams. And what you already know just from like the Zariski topology on schemes is that each of these three examples were stacks uh, in the big Zariski topology. And a tau descent, I was trying to argue last time that it actually implies that they're all, whoops, they're all stacks over the big tau site. Yeah, any, any questions before I move on? So your, your point is that the stackiness over Zariski is kind of by definition of these various objects. Yeah, it, it's, it's, yeah exactly. It's sort of like if you look at the axioms for being a stack in the big Zariski topology, they just translate exactly to the gluing conditions you're already familiar with. And right, the only additional thing that we're using is we're using this a tau topology. Um, and, and therefore we need to use a number of descent results. And I used a few sort of descent results last time, uh, and I'm gonna need similar results and more results this time. So I'd just like to like begin by giving a, a brief recap and summary of descent theory, at least how we'll use it today. Okay, so here's my, here's my summary of descent. Uh, and so let's, let's like first uh, look at this so everything in descent relies on this on this one key algebra fact up here, um, and it's sort of this, this technical statement about having an exact sequence. Um, and uh, but let me let me try to formulate the geometric version of this. So let's let's suppose that we have yeah that we have, let's just view this is is map from spec B. to spec A, um, and let's call this yeah, S prime and this S. And so the, the, the statement is if we take an A module, uh, M, well, let's, 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 let's sheafify it and let's let that be the quasi-coherent sheaf F. Uh, and, uh, and then if I take the, the restriction, the pullback, I'll just call that FS prime or maybe F prime, I'll denote that. And then I can also consider the two pullbacks here. And the point is that uh, over when, when I, the, the, the two, I mean, the point is that there's a canonical isomorphism between the two pullbacks of F prime. Such that under this canonical isomorphism, the sections that are identified uh, are, are, are M. So in other words, this key algebraic, algebraic fact is saying that uh, if you're given a module M over uh, the base here, you can actually recover it from its pullback by considering exactly sort of the, the, the kernel of this map. And so to state this even a, a slightly different way, so if you just maybe, let's just forget about F to begin with, you, you can, you, uh, the, the kind of the statement of descent is that you can recover F from this data. Um, and then so moving on from this like affine case, 
we can then uh, we can then have a, a more global version of this, which is what is featured in this in this bottom bottom half. Oops. And here I'm just going to so the descent is it, it works more more generally for faithfully flat maps and you know sometimes for reductions you might want to add quasi compactness hypothesis or a locally finite presentation, but let's just like restrict to uh, a tau covers because that's that's how we're going to apply it. So let's let's fix in a tau cover si to s, and so then the global version of this key algebra fact is that um, well let's say it in two different ways first in terms of morphisms and then in terms of objects. Uh, and so, uh, but what it says in terms of morphisms is that is that giving a map between two quasi-coherent sheaves is the same as giving maps between their pullbacks that agree on the double pullbacks. And likewise with objects, that an object over over the base is the same as objects over each SI and, and compatible isomorphisms. And so it is, you know, this condition. Uh, so it, yeah, it's this condition that allowed the, the stack of quasi-coherent sheaves to be a stack over the big Atal site. All right, so this, yeah, let me just write that here. This, all of this implies, so this, I mean, or it's equivalent, implies that the stack quasi-coherent is a stack over the big Atal site. Um, <clears throat> And then, okay, so, so we're going to build off this so we can descend modules. And if you think about uh, sort of, and, and, and so the next statement is that we can also descend affine morphisms. And so maybe, maybe here I'll draw a picture. So we have S, we have SI, and then we have these SIJs. And here, let's suppose we have affine morphisms from XI to SI, and then we have isomorphisms between their restrictions. Maybe, but yeah, uh, these are your alpha ij's satisfying a co cycle condition. And since affine morphisms are defined by, you know, o, OSI algebras, uh, you can just think of them as modules together with, you know, morphisms between the modules that give it the algebra, algebra structure. And so and then if you apply the descent for quasi coherent sheaves, you could descend, you know, the ring defining xi to, a, to, to at least to a module over s. And then you descend the algebra structure, and so you actually get uh, an affine scheme that that pulls back to xi. And so this is you can descend affine morphisms in the Atal topology. And a special case of that are closed immersions, right? This would be the case where each xi is closed in si. And then note that in this condition, here uh, since you're comparing closed. Uh, here, since you since there are closed immersions, you, you can you, you don't need to worry about this co-cycle condition. You could just say that xi restricted to sij, meaning the pullback under one of the maps is the same as the other one. And here, I, yeah, I should really be viewing these as products. So that's the first yeah, one application. So and we can we so we can descend closed immersions. And I'll, maybe I just want to recall. That last time, sort of, we 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 use this to show that MG was a stack because you know if, if you'd had maybe over each SI if you had a family of curves CI, what we showed was this, that this embeds Jared. into the projectivization of the push forward. Oops, running out of space. To the push forward of the third power. And then the idea was you, you, you look at this OSI module, you first descend that, so then you, so you can descend, so you can then find a quasi coherent sheaf uh, or even vector bundle over S. So that you take the relative projective space. And then you, you, and then since you have each of your curves are embedded, the CI, you can then descend these closed immersions to get a, a curve C over S embedded into that projective space. All right, this is all to say that. You know that this, yeah. Maybe I won't write it here. There's no space, but right. We use this case of descent to show that MG bar, sorry, that MG was a stack in the big Vital topology.
could you possibly explain why we have to take the third power? I've never really understood that because the second power already is ample. Oh yeah, that's a good question. Uh, wait, so the question was, why do you have to take the third power? Uh, in fact, you could take any power that I think it, it has to be at least three. But the, the point is, you need that that it, that it's uh, that the relative canonical sheaf that the that it's that is very ample and not just ample, and it's a fact that the third power works. Uh, and certainly for hyperelliptic curves, you know, the, the sheaf of differentials itself is ample but not very ample. Um, I'd have to think about why the second power doesn't work. And when we get to stable curves, we'll have a similar phenomenon. And there, there I have examples. Uh, I know of, of, of examples where the, even the second power of the canonical is not very ample. I think the second power just fails in genus two. It's only for genus two. Oh, OK. Even for smooth curves. I think that's right. Um, right, and the last descent statement is going to be uh, another special case of descending affine morphisms, which will be the principal G bundles. And since this is such an important notion, and I think a lot of people uh, get stuck with it, uh, let me remind you what, on the definition. Or let, let me, uh, let's, and, um, let's first fix G to T, the smooth and affine group scheme. And then the definition is that a, a principal G bundle or just G bundle over T is a map. So you, you have a scheme maybe P with a morphism to T and uh, a G action on P over T such that the, so that the map from P to T is G invariant. And then the condition is that it's just locally trivial in the sense that then, you know, there, whoops, that there exists an a tau cover such that when you base change, sorry, this is, I'm running out of space. So, so this is isomorphic to the trivial one, G cross TI. G equivariantly. And so you, you really just think of this, you know, almost like topologically, you know, the fibers are G, but you have, you, you have like a free action of G on the total space uh, and the quotient is T. And then therefore the, the corresponding statement for descending G, G bundles is the following. So this up in, in the upper left corner, um, we can descend G bundles and we can descend them. And, and the, the reason this works, the key point is because, because G, we are, we're assuming G is smooth and affine. So, and, and, and therefore uh, that a G bundle P to T is necessarily affine. It's necessarily an affine morphism. So you first descend it just as an affine morphism and then you descend all the other structure that makes it a G bundle. Essentially, just using descent for morphisms. Okay, but actually, more generally, you can ask. Oh, so if I can descend affine morphisms, what else can I descend? I also know I can descend closed immersions, and therefore, I can also descend that their their complements open immersions. Uh, and so, putting that together, you can descend uh, you can descend quasi affine morphisms. And in particular you can descend morphisms of schemes that are separated and quasi-finite because by Zariski's main theorem, they're necessarily quasi-affine. And then, I'm just stating this for later reference, uh, even more generally, we're gonna use this later, but not today, is that you can actually drop the, the so in, uh, in the, uh, okay, this is sort of technical, but in the definition of a quasi-finite morphisms of schemes, uh, it's that it's finite type plus, you know, finite fibers. Uh, and you can, you can have this more general statement where it's just separated and locally quasi finite.
But anyway, what I wanted to emphasize is what, what's on the right hand side, which is sort of the, these consequences for descent. And so let's let P be a property uh, where we have these, where we can, where we have effective descent. So like an open immersion, a closed immersion, it could be affine, quasi affine, or this more, more general one. Uh, or I, I should have yeah, maybe add, didn't write it here, a G torsor. Um, and so, the, so then let's consider a diagram here, where in this diagram, S is a scheme, S prime is a scheme. F is just a pre-sheaf. But you know that if you take the Cartesian pri product, suppose you know that if you take the Cartesian product, that F prime is a scheme, and this morphism satisfies property P. Then we're exactly in the in this in the situation like because f prime is the pullback of a sheaf, you're going to have uh, descent data for f prime over their uh, over their pullbacks, and therefore you can apply this effective descent, and you can argue that it's identified with f, and so you get this conclusion that that in fact that it, uh, that it implies that f is a scheme, and this map has property p. This is it. Uh, we'll, we'll use this statement today for G torsors. Okay, any questions on this? I feel like you'd need F to be a sheaf. I don't understand how it works if F's not, if just. A oh, yeah, I'm only going to apply it when F is a sheaf. I kind of got worried with that pre sheaf. Let's just say sheaf, just to, because I, I don't need the more general case. I was a little confused on that issue too. So Gerald, I have a question about this uh, descending maps, right? So you can't drop separated or locally quasi finite. Yeah, mm, no, not in general. I'm not. Yeah, not in general. Uh, if you want them to send them as schemes, once we introduce algebraic spaces, we'll see that you could always descend as an algebraic space. And so, but but it's actually it's it's a really tricky question in general. If you're given an algebraic space, well, okay, which we'll define today. It's a tricky question to know whether a given algebraic space is a scheme. Uh, and these are some, some cases in which you can argue that it's a scheme where you, yeah. Cool, thanks. Uh, so what is this Y? Oh, that shouldn't be, that's a typo. That's S. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, and so generally... could you repeat what is the uh, what is the statement here? Right, the, the statement is this, is this conclusion here. So like you have, so our hypothesis is that you have this tau cover S prime to S and that you have this morphism of sheaves from F to S. And then, I, then you consider this fiber product diagram. And then the conclusion is that if F prime is a scheme and the map from F prime to S prime has that property, then F is a scheme and the map F to S has that property. Thank you. This, sort of, this statement the, is sort of a, it's a reformulation of the other descent statements. And the other implication, we always, almost always have it, right? The other implication? The opposite. Yeah, the other direction. Yes, yeah, as long as that property is stable, yeah, for all these properties are stable in a base change. So yeah, so in fact, you, I think what the comment was that is it, this is in fact equivalence. Okay. Yeah. And I'm gonna remind you of one more background statement that will also come up today. And that's the notion of, of Hilbert schemes. Uh, and so I'll just remind you of the main statement. I mean, And, and so, yeah, <laughs> so let, let me uh, first, uh, let's, let's, I'll walk you through this. So we, we, we start with a projective morphism of Noetherian schemes, and we take a relatively ample line bundle OX of one. We fix some polynomial with rational coefficients. And then, and then, we, then we, we, we consider this moduli functor uh, where, where to a scheme S, you associate all closed subschemes of the pullback, which are flat, 
which are flat over the base and with, with a given Hilbert polynomial. And then the amazing theorem, which is, this is like the starting point for all of moduli theory, is that uh, it's represented by, this functor is represented by a scheme and it's projective over T. And like with descent, I mean, it, it, this is a statement that you can just black box. It's easy to internalize both like, what, yeah, uh, the content of the statement and, and it's also easy to apply it. Um, but like descent theory, I mean, it's also worth diving into the details uh, once you have time. I mean, it's, it's sort of a, a nice, yeah, a, a nice argument and that, revolve, that, that, that uses a number of important co concepts like, like uh, regularity and flattening stratifications. Um, but we'll just, I'm not gonna say much more other than, oh yeah, that, is that we'll, we'll use this result. Any questions? Okay, let's get started with the new material. Um, so I'm gonna introduce some, some key definitions here. Uh, so on the left-hand side, yeah, we just define, okay, we've seen a similar notion before. So we say that a map of pre-sheaves or pre-stacks is representable by schemes if for every map from a scheme, the fiber product is a scheme. So in other words, you know, I, I have F to G, I take a scheme S and I'm requiring that this fiber product is always a scheme. And then once you have, once you have a morphism uh, F to G that's representable by schemes, you can define any property. Uh, you can define properties of morphisms. You know, so if, if so, let, let P be a property of, of morphisms of schemes. The ones we'll use are surjective or a tau. And then you can just say that a map of, of, of pre sheaves or pre stacks, which is, which is assumed to be representable by schemes, has that property if for all maps from schemes, this induced map has that property from F cross GS to S. All right, now, so now we're gonna use this definition to define uh, algebraic spaces. So this is the first key definition of, of today. So an algebraic space by definition is a sheaf on the big tau topology such that there exists a scheme u and a morphism u to x. Oh, is it, I, I didn't write. So it's a sheaf x on the big tau topology such that there exists a scheme and there exists a map from u to x which is representable by schemes and a tau and surjective. Right, and, and we call, so yeah, this is the definition. And then we call u to x um, in a tau presentation. And I'm going to remark about this definition and the history and compare it to other definitions because, yeah, I'll just, yeah, this is not as, it's equivalent to, but not, uh, not quite the standard definition. Um, and maybe I'll just note here that like, you know, you can always cover schemes with affines. Uh, and so you can, you can always find an Atal presentation where, where U is affine if you want. Right, and so now we have algebraic spaces. Um, I'm gonna go back to the left-hand side and generalize these definitions. So, uh, so instead of saying that a map is representable by schemes, I'm gonna just say it's representable if for all maps from S to G, uh, this is 
an algebraic space. So a map is representable if for every map from a scheme or yeah, the fiber product is an algebraic space. And then we can also then define properties of, of, of morphisms between algebraic spaces. And I'm gonna cheat by enlarging this. And so maybe I'll... So now that we have algebraic spaces, let's let P be a property of morphisms of schemes, which is a tau local on the source. What this means, maybe I'll just spell it, spell it out. A tau local on the source just means that uh, if, if X prime is a tau and surjective, then, uh, and you have, a, and, and you have uh, then like, then X to Y has P if and only if the composition As P. That's what we mean by a tau local. And, and so if you have that, that property, just because algebraic spaces are defined uh, that have a, having a tau presentation by a scheme, uh, we can therefore define a morphism, a representable map. So if you take a representable map F to G, you say it has property P. If for all maps from a scheme, let me, maybe I'll draw the diagram down here. So you, you take a scheme, and you take it a map into G, you first compute this fiber product. This, because this map is representable, this is an algebraic space. And therefore, uh, yeah, you can, you, you can choose, and then for any atal presentation of it, say you, This fiber product is wrong. It's G and S. Uh, then, then you, then you, you want the composition here to have that property. Again, uh, yeah. So, we'll, we'll, yeah. Uh, shortly, we'll get into much more detail and background about properties of morphisms of algebraic spaces. But, but at least now we can talk about. Uh, what it means for a subjective atal or smooth morphism of, of algebraic spaces. Is there some kind of like comparison between different atal presentations of an algebraic space? Well, you oh, this isn't for all. Right? You have two different oh, yeah. atal presentations and you take the fiber product, you get like a third one that refines both. And, and usually you, yeah, you use that principle to, uh, to, to argue for instance, that different constructions are independent of the presentation and whatnot. Mm, right on. Um, also, why is it for the representable definition we're considering maps from schemes and not like maps just from any algebraic space, S? Oh yeah, it, it would be equivalent. Okay. Yeah. We'll get into the, all those technicalities and equivalences later. I just wanted to introduce the minimal amount of definitions necessary to define algebraic spaces and stacks. So does it suffice to pick a single Atal presentation to check P? Uh, well, I, uh, yeah, almost always, yeah. I mean, I think you, you, you technically you probably want to say it's also a Tau local on the target. Maybe you need it to be to be sta stable under composition and base change. But yeah, usually you, you can check all these properties by taking a single cover. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And for, for all, certainly for subjective, Italian smooth, you could, you could change this for all to an exists. True. Jared, in the second definition, do you need the map to be representable or? Because you already uh, defined yeah. what for representable to be, have property P in the first definition. Or I mean, Sorry, the second definition. So do you want to drop it from the third? No, 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 I, I, want, I want, yeah. So in, in this definition, I want it to be repre only representable by schemes. I'm defining properties of morphisms that are already assumed to be representable by schemes. And here I'm defining properties of morphisms that are uh, between, between sheaves or stacks that are, that's assumed to be representable. Um, by representable? You mean that the fiber product is an algebraic space? Yes. 
Oh, gotcha. Yeah, and yeah, that's what, so yeah, the, yeah, yeah, that's what I was trying to quickly define here. Maybe I should have just added that as a new definition too. All right, so, so really I have four definitions here. I, the definition of represent all by schemes, meaning that the fiber product of a, of a scheme is always a scheme, is also just representable, which means the fiber product from a morphism from a scheme or equivalent from an algebraic space is, a, is then an algebraic space. And then we've defined properties of morphisms that are assumed to be either representable by schemes or just representable. Right. And now, uh, so yeah, so now we can just define uh, an algebraic, uh, we define a Delene Mumford stack. Well, it's a stack over the big tau topology, such that there exists a scheme very similar to the above definition and a morphism U, uh, so the stack is, is X, U to X, which is uh, representable a tau and surjective. So it's almost like taking the definition of an algebraic space and replacing the sheaf with the stack. But the, the, there's one subtle difference that's not really that important. I mean, I'll say a few more words later that like the difference is that is, uh, it's just declared to be representable and not representable by schemes. And this map here, we call an Atal presentation. Yeah, and then we could just, we just repeat this definition here. Uh, in fact, let me, maybe I'll just cheat and copy it. And so we just, to, to move from a Delene Mumford stack to now to an algebraic stack, Uh, it's again a stack over the big tau topology such that there exists a scheme uh, and uh, and so we, we only change the tauness to smooth and then this we call a smooth presentation All right, yeah, so, so these are the, 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 the three main definitions of today. Algebraic spaces, delete Mumford stacks, and algebraic stacks. Uh, but, but maybe before taking questions, let me, let me recap sort of the history and compare these to, to the existing definitions in the literature. So first, okay, so first some history. Uh, algebraic spaces were introduced by, by Arden and Knudsen uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, there's some papers by, by Arten, and there's an entire book by Knudsen on, on algebraic spaces. And then uh, around the same time, Delina Mumford stacks were introduced by, well, Delina Mumford, uh, but they, they called them algebraic stacks. And then some years later, uh, Arten gave, uh, Michael Arten gave a more general definition uh, and uh, also called them algebraic stacks. And uh, so but I, I, yeah, I want to emphasize that there's, there's like this warning on the right hand side that um, like these, our definitions are not really standard um, and, and, and different authors, you know, have different hypotheses on when they define algebraic stacks. Uh, so for, first and foremost, I think maybe this is the most important here is that uh, usually there's some sort of representability condition on the diagonal. Um, and, but, but we will show actually that it's equivalent that, you know, just with this weaker definition it implies that the diagonal is always representable. I mean, this is, this is yeah, yeah. Uh, which is of course, yeah, this is a, yeah, a well-known fact. I mean, I'm not, yeah. 
And so, yeah, one of the first things we need to show when we develop the theory of algebraic spaces and stacks is that the diagonal is representable because we got yeah, it's an important property. And if you want, you can add that into the, the definition, but it's sort of, yeah, that, this is uh, more streamlined, I suppose. Um, and so if you yeah, are looking back at the history, you know, uh, algebraic, algebraic spaces, you know, when they were first introduced, they had, uh, there was a quasi compact hypothesis. On the, on the diagonal. Um, and then, in, in, and then Deline and Mumford, well, they didn't impose that condition, but they actually assumed that the diagonal was representable by schemes. Or in other words, that there's an Atal pre presentation by a scheme where that morphism is not just representable by representable by schemes. Um, and, but they, 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 they also remarked in their paper that they were well aware that this wasn't the complete, like the right definition in general. Uh, and, uh, but, it, but they, they point out that it clearly sufficed for, for their case because they were interested in MG bar uh, which is proper and, you know, has the diagonal has all of the, like, you know, is, is, is a finite morphism. Um, and, and maybe to point out that like, there, there's differences in the definition of Deline Mumford and the definition we're using only in really the pathological cases where the diagonal is like non-separated or not quasi-compact. Uh, if the diagonal is quasi-compact and separated, then it's necessarily representable by schemes. And then finally, Artin, Artin had other assumptions in his definition. I mean, he, he basically assumed everything, uh, assumed that everything was locally a finite type over uh, an, an excellent uh, dedicant domain. Um, only because, and he only added this because what he was really interested in was giving equivalent conditions like like what, what are now called Artin's axioms uh, for, 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 for showing that a given stack is algebraic. And uh, at the time, the sort of the Artin approximation result was only known for Dedekind domains, but you know, now people usually refer to what Artin stacks as, as, as at least as those stacks that satisfy Artin's axioms. So in particular, if they're like locally a finite type over an excellent scheme, but we won't use the terminology of Artin stacks, we'll stick to algebraic stacks. Um, and, and maybe I'll point out that we are, we are following both Olson's book and the Stacks Project. Maybe like the only difference here is that we use the big Italian topology. Whoops, not not the FPP topology. Okay, okay, that was a mouthful. Uh, yeah, if you're seeing this for the first time, just ignore these, all these various hypotheses on the diagonal or whatnot and take those three definitions as, as um, yeah, the main objects. But I'll, I'll pause here for questions. Does restricting to the et al topology make much of a difference? Wait, the, so I didn't hear that. Is there much difference between this et al topology and FPPF topology? In well, the they're very different, but then, um, I mean, you just have so many more covers in the FPPF topology, uh, but you can show in the end that, that when defining algebraic stacks that it's equivalent. Um, but I really, yeah, I don't want to get into those issues because they're quite, they're technical, but you can read about them and uh, just going, yeah, between different, different sites, uh, yeah, is, requires developing some, like, some background uh, and yeah, you can read about it in the Stacks Project. Okay, that answers my question, thank you. All right, so maybe I'll just, oh, I'll go back to the definitions so you can, you can stare at them some more. These are the three key definitions, algebraic spaces, Julian Mumford stacks and algebraic stacks. Okay. 
So now that we've defined what the geometric objects are, I should tell you what the morphisms are. And that's, you know, that's rather quick. So uh, I, I, just, I just define maps of algebraic spaces are just maps of their underlying sheaves or really pre-sheaves. And similarly, maps of billion Mufford stacks and, al and algebraic stacks are just maps of stacks or even pre-stacks. Um, and then, oh yeah, and then I have this exercise here, which I recommend is that you just show that, uh, we, we already showed that fiber products exist for pre-stacks. We showed that the fiber products of, of stacks is a stack. And now you're, you're asked to uh, bootstrap on that and show that you know, if you, if you have, yeah, that the fiber product, that the, these notions, algebraic spaces, delete Mumford stacks and algebraic stacks are closed under fiber products. And maybe let me, let me just say one other thing that will also just come up. Um, maybe this is an exercise is show that any stack over, suppose you want to work in the relative setting of schemes over S. Um, can be viewed as a stack just over the category of scheme. So you, you know, whoops. Uh, in other words, you just forget about the morphism to like to S, but uh, yeah. All right, so now we have some work cut out for us. I, I wanna now show uh, the main goal now after we've introduced the definitions is to show two things. I wanna show that quotient stacks are algebraic and I wanna show that MG is algebraic. Okay, and we're gonna do them in order. First, we're gonna to try to show that, uh, we're gonna show the algebricity of quotient stacks. And so on the left-hand side, I just have the setup. G to T is, is smooth and affine group scheme. Um, and let's take, let's take an algebraic space. Uh, oh, and, and if you want, okay, you may, maybe think if, if this generality is too much, just take T to be, you know, the spec, the spectrum of your favorite field. And then G is just like an, an honest, like smooth affine algebraic group. And here uh, I'm taking U to be an algebraic space uh, with an action of G. And this is defined, like I've just introduced algebraic spaces. I haven't said any, like any, anything else, but you can, like this is defined exactly analogous to schemes. Um, but if you want, you could just think you of, as a scheme if you want. Um, and so that now we define uh, something that we've defined, at least in the case when U was a scheme, uh, we define this, the quotient stack, uh, and this is a stack over the big tau topology in the relative case over T. But as I've just said, we could also view this as a, as a, as a stack over just schemes. And the objects are, uh, is the data of a principal G bundle together with a G equivariant map to the scheme U. And again, in the case that U is, is an algebraic space, you need to, you need to uh, make this precise, but it's, it, it's done in, uh, yeah, in the, exactly the same as schemes. All right, so there's the setup. And then the theorem is that, that it, this quotient stack is an algebraic stack. And moreover, that this canonical projection from U is a G torsor. And since G torsors, since we're assuming G is smooth and affine, this map is, you know, is representable, uh, smooth, surjective, or, and even affine. In particular, this is, this is a smooth presentation. Right, so we need to show, yeah, we need to show this. Um, okay, so let's set, uh, 
Okay, so let's set uh, x to be this quotient. And, uh, and so let, Be a map from a scheme, and and we can consider. So I do I do have a morphism from U to U mod G. And uh, oh, sorry, I, that was written as X, right? U mod G, and then if I take S to X, let's let's define the fiber product as U S. And what we need to show is that US to S is a G torsor. Because, this, that, because uh, yeah, because that, that, yeah, that, uh, that's exactly what it means for, um, for the, the, this cover U to the quotient to be a G torsor. And in particular, all of these maps, once you show this, all of these maps are smooth and affine. And in particular, US is, we, in particular, we need to show that US is a scheme. Isn't, shouldn't US, uh, sorry, is U here is just an algebraic space, not a scheme, right? Well, I, sorry, can you repeat that question? I didn't get it. Yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to wrap my head things. So you here, it's just an algebraic space. It's not a scheme. Um, That's right. And so this map from U to X, are we wanting it to to be representable or to be representable by schemes? So I'm, I'm confused oh, right, about right, if right. US should be a scheme or an algebraic space. Yeah. Uh, here we're, we're working more generally with U as an algebraic space. Uh, OK, uh, so I, I think you raise a good point in that um, Right. What, what we want, we want, we want this map. We want this this map to be representable by. Uh, we want it just to be representable. Period. Not necessarily rep representable by schemes. Uh, yeah. Um, but but I think your point is that oh, then I mean by the, in the definition of a stack I have a smooth pres smooth presentation by a scheme, not by an algebraic space. And so if you want, if, if, if you like, uh, you can always further, like if this is just an algebraic space, you can always find a further a tau cover where, the, where that's a scheme. And so then, does that answer the question? Uh, not quite. Yeah, so I'm fine with that. I just mean this U sub S, do we want it to just be an algebraic space or do we want it to furthermore be a scheme? This oh, in the end we want to show, yeah. So, so in, in the end, in particular, we want to show, yeah, that US is a scheme, affine over S. But this is, is, is this special to the, is this, if I'm understanding this is special to like this quotient, like in general, we would just want this to be an algebraic space, but That's for right. this quotient, it actually turns out to furthermore be a scheme. Yes, in, in this case, because of the assumptions we're making on the group scheme, that's right. So in general, you don't expect all your presentations to be, say, affine. But in this case, our presentations are, are even the, the morphism from U to X is even affine. Yeah, it's a good question. OK, cool. Thanks. This helps clear things up. All right. And now, OK, so and now what, we, what do we know? Well, we know that this quotient stack is, is the same as taking the pre-stack and taking the stackification. So what that means like that uh, if I, I have S to X and I have this presentation, um, what that means is that there actually exists some S prime, a tau cover and a morphism to U such, such that this is uh, too commutative. In other words, like every G bundle is trivializable in the, after, an, a, a, after an atal cover and a morphism from S to X, you know, factors through the, this cover if and only if that G bundle is, is trivial. And so you can always, after trivializing, get an atal extension that maps to you. 
and and then we're going to use we're going to use this we form the following cube where i first remember we have this g cross u to u to x to x remember we have this cartesian diagram al already and now i want to compare it to what's happening i have s um, I have s prime let me okay the, so I, I first take us this pullback and I can also take s prime and then I could take us prime and oh sorry uh, in this diagram let's see that the everything is Cartesian in this diagram except for the left and the right so the top bottom back and front are Cartesian. And let's see what we know here. Remember, we're really interested in knowing stuff about US. And at the moment, we just know it's a sheath. But what else do we know? I mean, we know that uh, this morphism from G cross U to U, we know that this is a G bundle, the trivial G bundle, and therefore it's pulled back from U S prime to S prime as a G bundle. And so if you just look at the back Cartesian square, uh, this, this here is a scheme, this is a scheme, and this is an Atal's rejection. And so we could use this effective des descent for, for, for G torsors. I mean, the, 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 what the, the statement that we had was that, yeah, was that like if you have the sheath US over S and after an Natal cover, if you know it's a G bundle, uh, then it's already a G bundle. And so we use that descent to get that US to S as a G bundle. And that's exactly what we wanted to show. All right, now let's let's use this now to show maybe the more complicated um, statement. Well, yeah. But first, before we move to MG, I just want to discuss kind of a nice consequence of this. And now, if G is a finite group, um, then if G is a finite group acting freely on an algebraic space X, then the, then the this then the quotient sheaf uh, is an algebraic space. And so here. Note that here, like the map from X to X mod G, because G is finite, is actually an Natal presentation. And so the upshot here is like free actions is the, yeah, is that free actions of a finite group on a scheme exists as an algebraic space. And this is one of our motivating factors for the first point to introduce algebraic spaces because you know, sure, if you have a finite group acting on a quasi projective variety, you can take the quotient. Uh, but there are some subtle examples where you can have something acting on uh, a finite group acting freely on a proper but not projective uh, variety such that the quotient doesn't exist. And since like finite group actions are ubiquitous in algebraic geometry, we want to be able to take the quotients. And uh, this says that we can as an algebraic space. But it also says something more. It says that the algebra, like this notion of an algebraic space is sufficiently nice in that it's closed under taking quotients. So we don't like, we've introduced algebraic spaces so that the quotient of a, a free action of a, a finite group on a scheme exists as an algebraic space, but that like this, but we can stop there. We don't need to go further and introduce a more general notion because it's closed under, under taking quotients by free actions. And now I want to turn and, and try to use uh, the algebricity of quotient stacks to show that MG is algebraic. So if G is at least two, my goal is to show that MG is algebraic. 
And to, to recap, uh, we already know it's a stack in the bigot tau topology. So what we need to construct is, is a smooth presentation. And our strategy is to, is to well, it, is to show that MG is identified with a certain quotient stack uh, where H is some Hilbert locus of parametrizing like three canonically embedded smooth curves. Because um, once we show this, um, we already know that the uh, right-hand side is algebraic by the former result. And this will allow us to conclude that M MG is algebraic. Okay, so let's let's try this. So uh, consider, so yeah, let's consider a family of curves C to S, smooth family. Uh, let's let this be pi, and what we know is that uh, that we can embed this into the relative projective space of the third canonical. Uh, and we know also, I'm just trying to just state everything we know so that we can, so that then the proof looks more natural. So this is of rank 5G minus 1. And note that what on, on fibers, what does this diagram look like if we restrict to a fiber over a point in the base? Well then, well then you actually have an embedding uh, into the projective. Like then, this is spec k over s. Uh, but the, yeah, then this vector bundle is trivial, so it actually embeds into just yeah projective space of, of dimension five g minus six. And moreover, the Hilbert polynomial you can compute just by uh, by Riemann rock. is let's P of N is six N minus one G minus one. Okay, and, and now we define, let's define H as the Hilbert scheme uh, in projective space of closed sub varieties or closed sub schemes of projective space of Hilbert polynomial P. Oh, I think. And this we know is projective over Z. And we also, yeah, we also know by Grothendieck's Dieck's theorem that it's representable. So we can take the universal family. So over H, there's a universal curve C which embeds into Here, this is the universal family. And now the idea, the main idea what we want to do is we just want to restrict, that we want to look at the locus in H where the family, where uh, of, of smooth curves try canonically embedded. Because I mean, this this H itself is, is is huge. You know, I mean, like Hilbert schemes can have awful sing singularities. So the the curves that they're parametrizing may not certainly may not be smooth. They may not even be pure dimension one. So we want to re restrict to nice ones. And so here's the formal the statement that will that the, a more precise statement that we need. Whoops. Uh, right, so the conclusion, or, yeah, so the claim is that there exists some H prime in H uh, locally closed. Um, and such that it contains all points H with the following three conditions. The first is that the fiber is smooth and geometrically connected. That's, yeah, that's, those are the curves in MG that we're parameterizing. 
Um, and moreover, uh, we, we're going to have this, we can assume that, um, well, we, we want to assume that the third canonical and the O of one uh, differ, by, differ by the pullback of a line bundle. Maybe the simpler, like maybe on a fiber, um, so like over a fiber H in H, this is just the condition that, uh, that if I take the, the third canonical of that fiber, it should be isomorphic to the O of one. So we don't want our line, we don't want our curves to be in, embedded by some other line bundle. We want them to be tri-canonically embedded. But not only that, we, it's not enough just to say that they're embedded by the right line bundle. You want them to be embedded by the complete linear series, not by some other linear series. So, so moving on to C, what, what we want is that, uh, that uh, the natural map from projective space to the restriction uh, and O of one here, we now we know is isomorphic to the third canonical. And I, I want that map to be an isomorphism. So this is, this is exactly what it means to say that it's embedded via a complete linear series. So now, now I have two tasks, oh, and not much time, but let me, let me try to finish. First, I'm first gonna uh, prove the claim and then I'm gonna use the claim to get algebraicity. Um, so here's, yeah, my uh, proof of the claim. So, uh, yeah. Remember, we, so we have this universal family over H embeds into projective space. And for A, uh, so maybe I'll break this into two parts, the smoothness and the connectedness of the fibers. For, for the, the smoothness, we just note that this is, just a general property that if I look at the point such that the fiber is smooth, this is an open condition. Um, certainly it's an open condition in the source, but, but our maps here are proper. So if you look at the, the closed locus in C where it's not smooth and take its image, uh, that's closed in H and that's exactly the complement of this open. And now the, the geometrically connectedness is a little, a little trickier, but you can take the Stein factorization, which is uh, say C, let's let this map be pi to pi to the spectrum, relative spectrum of pi push forward of OC, and this lives over H. Uh, and this map has geometrically connected fibers, uh, this map here. And, uh, and, and then, oh, and so if, if we let, let's let lambda be the induced map from OH to the push forward of O of C. And then, so then the condition in H that the fiber is geometrically connected is precisely the points in H where, uh, where this map lambda, where lambda is an isomorphism. isomorphism at H. Uh, so in other words, yeah, this is precisely the locus of H where you remove the support of the kernel and the co-kernel. Um, right, because maybe I should point out that, you know, this is a proper morphism. So this push forward is coherent. So this is a map of coherent sheaves and so the kernel and the co-kernel have closed support. So when you remove this, you get uh, an open locus. So basically that basically handles case A. So in other words, like let's just assume now, uh, we can assume now that, yeah, that, 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 yeah, that the fibers are smooth and geometrically connected. The second fact B is the tricky one. And here we need, we need to use something. Uh, and so here's the result we need. So the way I think about this result is that, okay, so then first state, state the, let me state the hypothesis. We have a morphism X to Y, 
with some conditions and a line bundle L over X. And so the conclusion of this theorem basically says that the locus in Y where the fiber of L is trivial is a closed locus. Uh, more precisely, it says that, yeah, you know, there's a closed subscheme such that, such that uh, where the fibers, where the fibers are, are, are uh, well, not exactly isomorphic, but differ by the pullback of a line bundle. Um, and it satisfies this functorial condition. Right, and yeah, uh, so I won't prove this, but this follows from some results in cohomology and base change. I mean, like the, the basic idea is you want to show that the, that the locus where a line bundle is trivial um, is closed and like you try to redefine this condition by, by sections of, of the line bundle and its inverse, right? Because trivial line bundles have, have, a, have one section and so does their inverse. This puts constraints and use upper semi-continuity to, to argue that it's, um, yeah, that is true. And I did, did want to say, uh, I, won't, I won't use this following fact, but I think it's sort of a nice reformulations of it. So I want to say that this, this theorem is also equivalent to the following fact, it's equivalent to the separatedness of the relative Picard functor, where the schemes over Y to sets where an S to a Y gets mapped to a uh, pick of X cross Y over S, and then you mod out by things from the pullback. And I, I, I like this, I'm just saying this because it kind of, uh, uh, it addresses this fact that sometimes complicated statements like the one above, if you reinterpret in, uh, it in the moduli perspective, it has like sort of a nice translation. But anyway, this, this, this theorem is precisely what gives us B. And then for C, uh, well, uh, we're, uh, let me just say it quickly. I really am running out of time. Like you wanna consider uh, the relative version of being a complete linear series. And so you study the map from to the, the push forward and, and you look at the locus in H where this is an isomorphism. And like before you just throw out the locus, the support of the kernel and the co-kernel. And so this, 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 this uh, shows C. Um, but I really, I, I did want to get to the, the sort of the, uh, main finale here, which was using this claim to show that MG is algebraic. And so then if you just give me uh, five more minutes, there won't be much time for discussion, unfortunately. Um, okay, so given this claim, let, I, I wanna note that there exists a functorial action of PGL 5G minus six, which is identified with the automorphism group scheme of projective space. Uh, wait, I think I'm off with this. Oh, maybe this should be five. Uh, there's a functorial action on H where you just like, uh, because because H is parameterizing things embedded, closed things embedded into projective space. You know, if you have an if you have an automorphism of projective space, you just move you just move it by move that subvariety subscheme by that element. And H prime in H is invariant. And our goal is to show that MG is isomorphic to H prime mod this group. And it's actually not, not that bad. So um, I'll do it in maybe three steps or four. Let's see, we first construct a map um, from H prime mod PGL 5G minus six from the pre-stack to MG. 
And here, it's, it's not so bad. Uh, if, I if I have a morphism from S to H prime, remember these were the objects in the pre-stack, I, ne I need to send it to some family of curves. But remember, H prime is a sublocus of, of the Hilbert scheme. So this itself corresponds to a family of curves over S and an, an embedding into projective space. So we can just send this to the corresponding family. Um, so that's the first thing. And the, se the th second thing to note is that this map is fully faithful. And the reason is that an, aut an automorphism of C over S induces an automorphism of the relative canonical, because after all, it's canonical, and therefore an automorphism of, um, of projective space. Um, in the case, because the, uh, or, or, and therefore, uh, yeah. In, in, in this case, like when, uh, on the, on the, on the right-hand side, we, because we, yeah, we have an embedding into projective space, this, uh, the push forward of this is, is actually, is, is trivial, so. Right. Um, yeah, so you check that this map is, is fully faithful. And then by the universal, universal property of stackification, there exists a map H prime from the stack to MG. And it's also fully faithful. And it, this is this follows from a simple exercise that if like that that if you have the map, if the map from the pre-stack was fully faithful, then the map from the, the stackification is also full, fully faithful. So the only thing that's missing is the essential surjectivity, because after all, yeah, we want to uh, we want to show that this is an isomorphism. But maybe I'll, I'll move over to here. Um, well, to, well, to show it, like let, let's let we need to show every family is in the image, and it suffices to show that for all families of smooth curves, that there exists in a tau cover such that the restriction CSI is in the image. This is sort of like saying what, what it means to like a surjective map of sheaves, you know, not any section lifts, um, but it, uh, it locally lifts. Um, and then because both things are stacks, if you know it locally lifts, then you can glue it, glue everything together using the fully faithfulness. But the point now, uh, yeah, but the, the point now is, well, all you do is you take like what, what we, yeah, you, you have this map C to S and you consider the push forward of the third canonical. You always have an embedding into that relative projective space but you just choose, you choose as a risky cover, you can even choose it to be as a risky cover, um, where, this, where this vector bundle is trivial, where it's trivial. You, you just use a trivialization of the vector bundle that gives you maps not into honest projective space and therefore corresponds to an element of, of the Hilbert scheme. Um, Wow, okay, that, that took longer than I thought, but I'm gonna I'm gonna end here and stop the recording.